We are down with the first hour. Our conversation revolved around um, you know, boosting, boosting the manufacturing agenda here in Kenya. Time now for our second conversation this morning. We just want to have a look at how to deepen and how to deploy artificial intelligence in Kenyans uh, or in Kenya's agriculture sector. And if I can um, you know, address you statistically, you have about 75% of Kenyan farmers are classified as smallholder farmers. And uh, you're talking about 7.5 million people. That's a huge number. And they contribute about 75% of the country's total agricultural output. And so this is a critical mass. And so the question is, how do you... Um, mechanize agriculture how do you employ technology in our agriculture sector that is a conversation that we're having this morning professor nicholas ozor is a science technology and innovation expert he's joining us here he'll be helping us uh, to go around this conversation professor thank you very much thank for you your time much. and we also have um dr joseph sang he's from um Jomo Kenyatta University of Agricultural Technology, and he's also an AI expert. Asante Sana, Joseph, for your time. Um, I want to start with Prof. Explain to us what is artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Um, simply put, uh, artificial intelligence is the capacity of machines to perform the cognitive functions that human beings can do, such as reasoning, such as perception, mm -hmm. such as thinking, and doing so many other things that human minds can think of yep. uh, in such a way that it will be smarter and more accurate mm -hmm. and more productive. So this is the best way to explain uh, artificial intelligence when machines begin to do some of the things that human beings can do and do it even better. Um, what we try to promote is not just artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. but what we call responsive or responsible artificial intelligence. Because artificial responsible, responsible. That which means the there is also the irresponsible. Yes, there could be responsible artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, um, because uh, when we talk about responsible artificial intelligence, we are looking at being able to develop, deploy, and scale artificial intelligence that are uh, lawful, that respect human rights that will not interfere with your privacy mm -hmm. and will be able to be friendly to the society and to the environment, the environment in, in general. So uh, that is why we try to quickly uh, add that word responsible in the kind of artificial intelligence technologies and innovations that we promote, uh, for, especially for Africa. G give us an example of how, you know, artificial intelligence can be used irresponsibly. So if, uh, artificial, if someone is able to monitor your privacy using AI and is able to see you and then without you giving permission for him to see you, mm -hmm. or if someone is able to access your, your computer... For without instance, your permission. Without your permission mm -hmm. and be able to retrieve the data that you have in your computer and use it for his or her own uh, personal gains, then the person may have infringed in your own uh, privacy and this is possible using AI. And that Monitor is what we call you. infringement of privacy. That is infringement and that is irresponsible. And uh, But we know what it can create and that's why we are promoting responsible artificial intelligence where machines can be used responsibly to produce um, goods and services. And remember, uh, we are focusing on agriculture and food systems in this case. So we are focusing on 
the four key components of agriculture and food security, mm -hmm. which is in making food available, food availability, making food accessible, ensuring that food reach everyone, and also uh, making food uh, usable or utilizable uh, in such a way that you can process food, store food, and it can serve for a longer time. And then being able to uh, stabilize food in terms of making food policies, in terms of uh, predicting the weather uh, to be able to guide farmers mm -hmm. on when to produce and when not to produce. So these are the things that, uh, among many others, that uh, artificial intelligence can do for you Very in good. agriculture and food systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be coming back to you so that you can take us through uh, these four steps, you know, availability, accessibility, usable, and so much. Uh, but I want to bring now on board uh, um, uh, Dr. Sang. Uh, Dr. Sang, w w what is the need of employing um, AI in our agriculture system? I think the need of employing AI in our agriculture system is basically to optimize on production. And that is a broad uh, thing that can we talk about. We are looking at uh, being able to improve on the production per unit area, <coughs> to improve uh, production in terms of controlling diseases and even uh, adapting more of integrated pest management and everything that's around that uh, farming. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what we are trying to help our farmers to do. What is the advantage of, um, you know, uh, deploying AI in our agriculture sector? Uh, <coughs> I think there are a number of uh, advantages uh, mm -hmm. can we, we can get from deploying AI in our agricultural systems and from the entire value chain, being able to produce at optimum, being able to and all the issues to do with uh, soil production, diseases, and anything that can affect that production. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> um, Ozo, you're talking about the four facets of agriculture. Um, you've touched on availability, accessibility, you know, the usability. Um, when we talk about availability, what exactly do you mean? Um, I think I'll, draw, I'll, I'll take it up from where he stopped. Um, as you know, Africa today is uh, about 1.4 billion people mm -hmm. in population. Yeah. And um, research showed that we need to increase food production up to 70% if we are to feed this 1.4 billion people. Increase food production by yes, by seventy percent. By seventy percent. So to produce this food, we need to do. Are you talking about today or in the future? As at today. As at now. Actually, by twenty fifty, Africa will be two point six billion mm -hmm. people. So we are talking about twenty twenty three. We are about one point four billion people, and if we are to feed these people, this population, we need to do things in extraordinary way. Kenya is just 50 million adding to this. Now, to produce optimally, like he was saying, we need to deploy science, technology, and innovation that are responsible to ensure that food is produced in such a way to feed this growing population. We are aware of uh, some vagaries, some distortions, that are already affecting food production, such as resource scarcity. We don't have enough money to buy inputs and plant, mm -hmm. such as climate change. Of course, we know the impact of flooding, the impact of uh, drought as it is affecting production. Uh, we know of uh, conflicts and war. Of course, you know that, uh, for instance, the war in Ukraine and Russia is seriously affecting the availability of wheat, even in Africa here. So, amongst other things, given these conditions, we must do things in such a way that food production will not be affected. And every country needs to conduct its own institutional analysis to be able to identify which technologies will fit best for it.
We have many other technologies. We even have indigenous technology. Remember, uh, we didn't just uh, exist from nowhere. We have our own way, uh, uh, traditional ways that our, our parents and grandparents have been able to survive and sustain in feeding themselves. We have mechanical technology, we have biotechnology, we have nanotechnology and all this. But we are saying that artificial intelligence is an emerging technology that has the capacity to transform the entire agricultural sector to be able to sustain food for our teeming pop population. Mm -hmm. And we must not wait for the West to do it and then we copy. We have to join the league now so that what happened to us during the Industrial Revolution, where we waited and people developed technologically, and we have to now be buying technologies at higher costs, will not happen to us again in this emerging technology. Mm. So in food production, which is just an aspect of food security, artificial intelligence can help you to predict the yield that you are going to get from a particular production. Take maize, for instance. You are giving a, a particular species, giving a particular soil, because AI can help you to determine the soil quality, can help you to determine the content of the soil, can help you to say, given these variables being constant, yeah. you are able to get so and so tons of maize from this particular soil if you produce at this level. AI can predict that. AI can tell you when pests and diseases are about to invade your crop or farm. It can predict using so many variables because that's why we are talking about data in AI. You can't work, you can't train models by uh, words. Mm -hmm. You use data to do this. And uh, so AI can help you to know when pests and diseases that reduce the production level yep. are about to affect attack your your farm and what i'm and getting you, from you able to uh, tackle it what i'm getting from you is that um you know you know deploying ai you know will help you in the decision making process and at the same time it will help you in deploying uh, strategies that will mitigate against losses exactly very good well before we went for 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 that break um also, we were, we were, you, 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 you're taking us through the advantages of deploying um, uh, AI in, in our agriculture sector, and you're taking us, uh, um, uh, you, know, the, you know, the various facets of uh, food availability, you know, accessibility, um, uh, uh, usability, and, 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 and so much. Uh, help us understand, what is the role of uh, the African Technology uh, Policy Studies Network in advancing the AI agenda in our agriculture sector. Oh, thank you very much. Um, ATPS, that is African Technology Policy Studies Network, is uh, a transdisciplinary network of researchers, policymakers, civil society actors, and the private sector actors that promote the generation, the dissemination, the use and mastery of science, technology, and innovation mm -hmm. for Africa's development for environmental sustainability and global inclusion. ATPS is uh, the premier science, technology and innovation organization in Africa, established about four decades ago with its headquarters based here in Nairobi, mm -hmm. but we work across 30 countries and with institutional partnerships across uh, the 54 countries in Africa. We also have diaspora chapters in the UK, Australia, and the United States of America. So because of the mandate that we have to promote science, technology, and innovation, not only in research and capacity building, but also in policy making, um, we have been uh, lucky to be selected to be leading in the development, deployment, and scaling of science, technology, and innovation uh, on the continent, and particularly the artificial intelligence in agriculture and food systems. And it is on this initiative, which is being funded by the International Development Research Center of Canada, IDRC, and CEDA, Sweden, uh, we have been able to identify other collaborators and partners across Africa. Currently, we are working and funding about 10 innovators 
uh, across Africa. And luckily, Kenya has, uh, we have two of them in Kenya who we are supporting and working with to develop and deploy artificial intelligence on, uh, in, in, in Kenya. Uh, because we know that this is a new and emerging technology. Uh, there is need to provide some seed funds for uh, and build capacity of people to be able to deploy this. This is a new technology and uh, not everybody has the capacity. So our effort is one, to support in identifying those who have the capacity mm -hmm. and strengthen their capacity to be able to develop, deploy and scale AI in agriculture. And uh, also support because we know for you to be able to make AI responsible, it must be guided by policy. We are also looking at developing and supporting African governments like Kenya to develop AI policies and regulations so that there, are, there, are, there will be frameworks set in place to guide those who are entering into this new area so, so that they will use it responsibly. As we speak, Africa has uh, not really embraced AI uh, development and deployment because in terms of uh, maybe um, policy and regulations, because only two countries in Africa today has AI policies, like uh, Ghana and uh, Rwanda, they have. Kenya has a good opportunity because um, the investment of Kenya in R&D is, is among the highest in Africa, 0.8% of the GDP. And uh, they are working towards getting 2% of the, of the GDP to R&D by 2030, according to the Constitution. So they have good opportunity mm -hmm. to, to latch into this but there is something they need also to do. It is highly important for the government to create a separate ministry of science, technology, and innovation so that they will be able to delve wholly into uh, developing STI issues that will help to support other, because of course you know the constitution is based on the pillar STI. STI is the pillar of the, of the constitution of Kenya. And if they, can, if they want to utilize the best of the science, technology, and innovation um, technologies and all those, there is need to create a separate ministry. And this is policy who can, that can now take charge of regulating research and innovation around artificial intelligence. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, you're talking about an institution that has been there for the last time. Um, you know, four decades, uh, yes. you're looking at 40 years. Um, you have, um, you, 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 you operate in, th in 34 countries? 30 countries at the moment. 30 it's countries. Partnerships in the remaining. And you have, African you have footprint in the, in the next 54 countries. Yes, yes. Uh, and, 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 and I, you know, I had you say that um, um, you receive, um, you know, your, your operational cost is, 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 a, is from the donor community. And, and so these, that challenge then comes. Uh, so how then do you implement uh, a, a concept and project that benefits uh, the African continent while you are getting funding from foreign missions who have their interests that needs to be taken care of? Thank you very much. Um, this is a very interesting uh, question because... Um, and I will take you a little bit down the memory lane. In 1980, the African heads of state had um, a, a, a Lagos plan of action where they agreed that every country shall invest 1% of their GDP to research and development. From 1980 to now is how many years? Looking at um, 43, 43 years. Or more. Those years, there has been no country on the continent from 1980 to now that have been able to invest 1% of their GDP to research and development in the con on the continent, generally. Kenya, it's 0.8%? It's Kenya is even at the top with 0.8%. Showing they are doing well, and there is direct correlation between investment in this 
research and development, that is the money that you bring out to support R&D or science and technology, and also your ability to develop innovations or your innovativeness. That if you look at the 2023 Innovative Index, Kenya is number eight. We have countries like uh, Mauritius as number one, South Africa, even Cape Verde. Because today, Cape Verde is, is among our beneficiaries in uh, artificial intelligence in agriculture. And they are today flying drones. Rwanda is flying drones. Kenya is not yet flying drones and using drones to deploy technologies, uh, I mean, to deploy services like uh, in Rwanda, we hear and we see they use drones to deliver health care in rural areas where you may not, be easily, may not be easily accessible. Same with agriculture. But until, and that's why I talked about policy, because it is policy that will guide this. Now, for the sake, for the fact that African governments have not taken a good leap in terms of uh, supporting science, technology, and innovation. The African Union is doing their best, but we also know that the African Union, uh, most of their uh, funds don't come from the African it countries. They come from the continent. They come from Europe. Actually, almost 70% of their budgets. You have said that. And that shows you that we, are, we have not yet arrived. And therefore, when we see an opportunity to uh, tap into emerging technologies like this, the only duty we owe the continent is to ensure that it, it takes care of local content. We will work with the donors to say, we are not going to develop this artificial intelligence to monitor your own crops, the crops that you, good, you put preferences to, we are deploying it for our own local crops so that that is the crop that will, when I say crop, I mean crop, livestock, and any other area in agriculture that is peculiar to us as indigenous people. So we are going to tell them, or we tell them that this AI will be deployed for agricultural production, utilization, uh, access, stability, that are of interest to our countries, not specifically to, and we, where we don't agree, for us at the ATPS, we normally say we are not able to uh, work with you, mm -hmm. because the interest must be mutual. So we are not ashamed to be working with countries who want to support Africa, not to lag behind in embracing science, technology, and innovation, but we are working with them to develop mutually, uh, mutual, mutual pathway that they will be happy and we will be happy as well. Very because good. that technology is to serve Africa. Very well. Um, uh, Dr. Sang, I, I want to hear from you. I mean, when people, you know, hear technology being mentioned, uh, there's always that tension, uh, you, you know, between technology and human beings because... Um, in some instances, human beings are afraid of technology uh, uh, because technology comes to straighten things and to make processes um, much simpler and, and, and easier. Uh, so uh, is AI here to take the job of our farmers? <coughs> Thank you for that good question. I, I think uh, coming from uh, University of Te Agriculture and Technology, uh, we embrace technology and I would uh, straight away answer your question that AI will not uh, uh, will not come and take the job of the farmers, but it will help the farmers in doing their work. I would like to point out a few examples that we are doing and working with ATPS that will maybe explain that. Um, you know that agriculture, unlike the manufacturing before, is contributing about 33 percent of our GDP, and so the agriculture plays an important role in our economy. We have uh, partnered with uh, other private organization and vegetable farmers in Machakos to try and deploy AI. And this AI is helping them to address what uh, 
Professor Yas raised the issue of diseases. For this farmer who cross tomato, and his tomato is usually cut, production is curtailed by presence of pests uh, that attack their diseases, their, their tomatoes. We want them to be able to use to adopt the AI technology, of course, with our support and support of our private partner, and working with them to be able to adopt this AI technology and be able to know, okay, we live in the climate change and everything that is happening around that, they can be able to predict when they are likely to be affected by this pest. That help them in their production in this sense that when you know you, the likelihood of the diseases, your reaction will be measured. You know, okay, I'm, I'm at this level of a uh, disease attack. I, I need to prepare or I need to intervene. And we are working with them, teaching them on the various intervention that uh, AI is telling us maybe at this level, this is the kind of intervention that you are supposed to intervene, uh, adopt. And also we can predict even maybe down the line when the disease are likely to happen. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, do we have an example of um, of um, uh, a farm where you know AI has been deployed and the results are showing? Yes, we, I think there are many farms uh, that have adopted uh, various forms of AI in Kenya. But what we are doing currently, we are piloting with the farmers. Uh, actually, with small scale the, farmers, the seventy-five percent that you talk about, the small scale farmers, mm -hmm. we have about two hundred farmers that we are teaching them that uh, the results of this AI can inform their decision, uh, how their reaction on attack of their tomatoes, and how they can be able to prepare in advance. Mm -hmm. So the. That is how we want to see this technology being adapted by the small-scale farmers going forward and, and hopefully we can get some good results. Mm -hmm. uh, it has always been said that um, it's, it's very hard to, to teach um, an old dog new tricks. And when you look at um, the average age of a Kenyan farmer, you're looking at about 60 years. Yes. And, and, and here you are, you are now re trying to reorient their minds, you know, to focus on the emerging technologies and teaching them new ways and new habits of, of farming. Is this, is this a walk in the park? It is not. But interestingly, it's, uh, we are getting some traction. We had a training of about uh, 50 farmers yesterday, and I think 40% of, the, of them showed up with a smartphone. And we were able to link them to data online to try and tell them this is, look at your farm, even you get this kind of information, and it tells you even how to react depending on the information you're getting. And yes, I know we are saying the age of the farmer is way well advanced, but we have this also few people who are coming in as youth and catalyzing the whole process. So they are adapting the technology and influencing even the older people to adapt the technology. Mm -hmm. And it's going far and wide. Uh, we now know that uh, even weather data is being shared across in the village with WhatsApp. And we hope this is also how the information that we generate from the AI technology can be shared across the village and inform the decision making by this group of many farmers so that they all have that mutual protection or mutual decision making against uh, pests and diseases that affect their crops. Mm -hmm. D during your training, and you, you're talking about yesterday, you had about 50 people yes. uh, you know, um, showing up for the training. Yeah. Uh, what is emerging as the number one uh, uh, challenge that you are facing with the, with, with, with the farmers? Uh, I, yes, uh, I think uh, the number one challenge, uh, but the opportunity first is the farmers are willing to learn. Mm -hmm. They are willing to adapt any technology that will help them to improve on their production. Yeah. Of course now the, the challenge that you have asked about is what everybody faces when you are trying to deploy the technology. That uh, the age of the farmers, they, are we advanced and technology may not be some may their piece of cake that adapting it they need more support so and of course the availability of technology so a jquat and the private partners gri and having moved together they are able to avail this technology to them but without that they are not able to access this technology but uh, <coughs> and also them have uh, that know-how could be missing but we are able to go to them take calls to the great extent of sitting down with them, even speaking to them in their vernacular and trying to explain to them, this is how the technology will work, this is how the technology will help them. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, the architects of, um, you know, artificial intelligence, um, the, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, they are global. 
and, and so their thought process is, is highly global. And so um, when they are coming up with applications, when they are uh, uh, even in the execution, I mean, it's all in, in, in foreign language. Yes. And, and, and so uh, now trying to transform that information to um, somebody uh, using the local languages and local understanding, I mean, that is definitely a, a major challenge. And, and so how are you handling that? Thank you. I, I think I agree with you that um, the technology has been developed globally and it is, could be beyond us, as he implied that uh, this is technology that is foreign and the donor is funded by donor. But I think it gives challenge and opportunity to an institution like Jomo Kenyatta University of Architecture and Technology mm -hmm. to be able to bring this to a local context, like what we are doing now with farmers, to make sure that they understand or they be able to get the, uh, provide the information we interpret the information for them and for them to get the message and interpret it for their good. So it is, I think, our institution here locally have to really focus and try to make this palatable for our people. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, during your training, um, and, and I'm sure you have noticed these, um, that um, you know, most of the farmers, um, they, are, they, they have feature phones. Uh, they, m m m most of them, they don't have are smartphones yes. uh, they have feature phones um which is um, uh, which is you know cheaper yeah. and uh, more convenient for them mm -hmm. uh, but for the information to be transmitted i mean it has to be used to using smartphones yes. yeah. uh, how are you working with our transition um it's true that uh, in the village and by the way the training is also going on now and tomorrow so with, with this group of, so we have split them into groups. Um, we have been lucky to have a few that have, uh, majority, almost 30, 70% are that, to that, so that have showed up with the right forms, which mean uh, the penetration of 70%? This. Yeah, in my did, did, did you pick them? Was it random or you picked them? My estimation, the people who showed up with the right form. Okay, um, Kadana uh, vegetable growers is actually I can say a progressive farmer group. Mm -hmm. They have been working together in groups and trying to work together for a while. Maybe they are not representative of a typical farmer in the yeah. out there that most of them are being exposed to technology. So for them to 70% to have showed up with smartphone is something good. But maybe uh, for other farmers, this is something that we could consider in terms of policy. And I think the president are talking about uh, something to avail smartphone in the country at a cheaper rate. Hopefully that is revisited and made available with preference to farmers so that this information can go to them and increase their contribution for, to the GDP from that 3% to something upward of that. The phone that we are talking about is retailing at about 7,000 shillings. Yep. On top of that you have to buy data. Yes. And um, you know, other related cost, and, 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 and so um, what I'm trying to pick up your mind on is um, mm -hmm. apart from capacitating farmers, you know, with yes. information, yes, do you go beyond that? Um, I think uh, that is a challenge that we're asking ourselves after this farmer now invest on a smartphone or be able to invest on in this information, what else can they get? So, we are looking at uh, trying to diversify our app that we have developed for them to be able to be a center of in total information not just for the pest that we are interested in mm -hmm. but we want to expand this so that this farmer can really get all the information yeah, at the in the, from their smartphone just to increase on that uh, use mm -hmm. and hopefully for other farmers to be able to make it more useful and worth investing the seven thousand that we are talking about mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, so. yeah. It's not, uh, for now, I, I agree, it's not worth investing uh, 7000 on a smartphone just to know about a pest. Precisely. But if we are able to provide more information, mm -hmm. maybe it can increase the value. And that is our next agenda. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why I want to hear from Ozo, because um, uh, Ozo is the man with the money. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still looking for it. I'm still looking for it. You're still looking for it. Yeah. I mean, money would never be enough, but... Um, uh, do you think it is high time now, you know, we, 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 we move now beyond um, 
arming our farmers with the right information and now providing them with what we call the supporting infrastructure and the supporting infrastructure could be in, in terms of hardware or software and software I'm talking about maybe uh, financial resources hardware could be mobile phones other toolkits and so much so that you ensure that you capacitate the farmer from point A to point Z yeah um, I think is very possible because it has been done elsewhere. Uh, the current president of the African Development Bank, uh, Dr. Akimumi Adeshina, uh, when he was the Minister for Agriculture in Nigeria, yeah. provided smartphones for farmers in Nigeria, mm. free of charge, and uh, this helped farmers to access inputs, mm. to access information, to uh, link up with the extension system to be able to get information relevant to their production, processing, and the utilization of agricultural goods and services. So it has been done before, and it can still be done again. But let me remind you that the farmers are not as poor as you think. Mm -hmm. uh, studies have shown that smartphone penetration in, our, in countries like Kenya is about 85% to 90 So, and for us, sometimes when we go Are to you train... you talking about mobile phone penetration or not, smartphone? I said I was smartphone, not mobile phone, because mobile phone is everywhere. Mm -hmm. There is hardly a family, there's no family you will come to that you will not get someone having a mobile phone. So, um, don't think that... Uh, the farmers are that poor mm -hmm. because uh, we have done some training uh, that required smartphone across five countries in Africa uh, using um, our technology called land PKS land potential knowledge system mm -hmm. which we try to um, make farmers to access climatic data and soil, de soil information in situ wherever they are yeah. Now, we worked in Tunisia, Nigeria, Malawi, Cameroon, Kenya, and we were able to find out that wherever we go to train farmers, ranging from 200 to 300 farmers, over 80% of them will always have smartphones. And when you ask them, how come you are this old and you are a farmer and you have a, a smartphone, he said, do you think that you, if I don't live in the city, my son, my daughter is living in the city and he has bought me this smartphone and is using it? So, in as much as we know that government can subsidize this facility mm -hmm. to enable them access information, especially as we are talking about, because information is power. AI goes with information, goes with these smartphones. So government can take it as a point of duty to subsidize mobile phones, smartphones, specially targeting the farmers. But one, one, uh, one, one other thing I want to add is the, the scale of, economy of scale, which the manufacturers mentioned earlier in the morning today. If these farmers are able to form themselves into cooperative groups, yep they will be able to easily access support and even grants and funds from institutions like us because we have supported some. That's how we're able to support them and other we are supporting uh, uh, the, the Jomo Koyenta University with, uh, with uh, uh, Geospatial Research Institute. We are supporting Strathmore University uh, and some other uh, institutions in Kenya and organizations who have formed themselves uh, you know into groups very well because you are able to now access funds you will be more legitimate because it's not like an individual so you can be traced and so on and so forth very good um, I mean I'm, I'm, we need to disabuse that notion that um, um, you know um, um, lack of a mobile phone I mean of a smartphone I mean it's is not a sign of poverty. Uh, there are people who are very much contented with the feature phone because their business of their business is just to call and to text, and that's all. They don't want to go beyond that point.
And I also want to emphasize the fact that, uh, you know, according to the Communications Authority of Kenya, uh, statistics. Um, uh, the smartphone penetration in Kenya is about 65%. Uh, it has risen from 51% um, in a span of two years. And the other information is the fact that um, you know, uh, uh, the penetration of smartphones is, is highly in urban areas. And we know that farming happens in the rural areas. And so it's, 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 a, you know, it's a challenge to all of us to ensure that, uh, you know, apart from providing farmers with rights information, we also provide them with the necessary tools uh, to help them uh, advance that agenda. Gentlemen, I can see time is well gone. It's almost coming to 7 minutes to 12 o'clock when we have Kurunzi Mashinani uh, bulletin, uh, which is coming up. And so... We want to thank you this uh, morning for joining us and, of course, for sharing us this insight. We'll continue to engage more, you know, um, in the future. Otherwise, your time is highly appreciated. Thank you. Thank Asante you very, very good. Yeah. Well, we have been talking about uh, advancing um, artificial intelligence in Kenya's agriculture sector. We have been in the company of Professor um, Nicholas Ozor. He's a science, uh, technology, as well as innovation expert. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Joseph Sang, he's... Um, an AI expert from Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology joining us this morning. The first hour of our conversation was around uh, uh, driving the manufacturing agenda here in Kenya. Well, two hours down, we come to the end of this check this morning. Thank you so very much indeed for your time. O'Brien Kimani is my name. Uh, Kurunzi and Tamarini uh, is coming up next. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>